Hi, everybody. We'll just give it another minute for people to filter into the room and then we'll go live. Uh, while we're waiting, just want to give a shout out to Lynn Bodwell. Thank you for this great slide. Keeps everybody from having to uh, stare at my face for five minutes. So I'm sure you guys all join me in thanking Lynn. Good afternoon. I think we'll uh, we'll get started now. It looks like uh, we've got a number of people have uh, filtered into the room. So good afternoon. I'm Steve Bassman, and along with Aaron Marsden, I would like to welcome everybody on behalf of Canasa and Security Canada to our weekly online learning session. While many are stuck at home, we thought this would be a good time to deliver some product and service knowledge that will be beneficial when we're all back to work. I would like to say a special thank you to RBH for their support and sponsoring today's session. Today, I have the pleasure of introducing Christopher Nolan, Director of Sales and Marketing at RBH. Christopher is a 20 year veteran of the Canadian security industry and has held sales and technical positions with several leading security and life safety manufacturers. Christopher can be reached at christopher.nolan at rbh dash access.com and we'll put that up at the end as well feel free to type any questions you may have for christopher during the session into the chat window and he will respond during the q a portion roughly 20 minutes from now i'll now turn the session over to christopher welcome christopher thanks for being here hey steve i uh, appreciate that and uh, thank you everybody for dialing in uh, i know we all lead busy lives and it's a crazy time right now so uh, it is appreciated um, so what I'm going to talk about today about, um, um, about RBH and, and access control, um, I'm going to talk about risk and, you know, there's some, some classic risks, there's some new risk and I'm going to talk about solutions, modern solutions to areas of risk. Um, now, before we get into the presentation, just to give you a crash course on, uh, RBH and we've been around for it since 1995. Um, everything is manufactured in Canada. All the sales, the engineering, the production is all out of uh, our Brampton facility. However, we are a, a global, uh, a global uh, supplier of access control and security. Uh, we operate in 125 different markets across the world, um, and that allows us to have you know global resources, but local attention to the dealers. Um, in the, across Canada, we have sales engineer, sales managers uh, from coast to coast, um, and of course, if there's uh, uh, anything at a national level, um, I'm here to uh, help as well. Um, any, uh, any of the information that you see today, everything's available on the RBH website. I uh, know it is password protected, so feel free to dial in and uh, get a password. Um, and uh, at that point, you can download the software, data sheets, application notes, anything that, uh, that, that you might uh, need. Okay, so let's take, a look at, uh, let's take a look at risk with access control. Um, traditionally, there's been certain areas of, of, of risk. Um, if we're all familiar with Airbnb and, and the duplication of cards, um, that's uh, probably the most popular one right now. Uh, there's some new technologies that can, uh, you know, clone the communication between the reader and the control panel. That's a relatively new risk. And then, of course, COVID-19. That, uh, that recently has brought a whole other bucket of risk that uh, and had added to the complexity and, and um, uh, on the problems that we have to deal with in the access control business. So this business presentation is structured to talk about these individual risks and what RBH can do to, to help uh, uh, mitigate those and solve those. Let's take a look at the first one. So let's take a look at the risk for COVID-19 in general. So access control typically doesn't have a lot of uh, contact. Um, you know, proximity readers, uh, cards will work six to eight inches, so you don't have to, you know, touch your card to the reader. Um, not a lot of contact with access control. But there are certain cases where perhaps, let's say you have visitor management. You know, you have 25 cards sitting in the desk. Visitor needs a, a badge for two days, maybe it's not a contractor, he needs access to the building, certain areas. So you would have to somehow take out that card, sanitize it, give it to him, manage it, bring it back, make sure it's sanitized uh, when, upon its return. So there is areas of, of physical contact. Visitor management is one example. 
Uh, another one is, is clustering around access points. Um, as we move from proximity cards to smart cards, uh, one thing people are noticing is that the range of, of smart cards are diminishing. Rather than getting six, eight, 10 inches of range from the card to the reader, sometimes you have to wait a second to present your card to the reader, sometimes even touch the credential right to the reader itself, wait a good moment before it uh, actually unlocks the door. Um, you know, if there's a high volume area, that starts, you know, bringing in clustering of people around that access point. Uh, another big problem is, is with multi-factor authentication. Um, you know, for high secure applications, maybe critical infrastructure or IT rooms, um, the idea here is we don't want to just drop your card in the parking lot, somebody picks it up, now they have access to the building. So for, you know, critical infrastructure, IT, high-risk applications, we use multi-factor authentication. You present your credential, and then of course you'd have to then type in a PIN number afterwards. And the idea is you might lose your credential, but that person wouldn't have access to your PIN. Now with COVID-19, people are gonna to be touching that reader. How do, we, how do we keep that sanitary? Uh, sanitary? How do we keep that uh, uh, you know, contactless? The second risk is, is pretty, pretty traditional. Um, it's the risk of uh, proximity cards and, and duplication. So quick crash course on the way that proximity cards work. You know, the, the reader is always put, uh, producing an energy field, you know, six, eight inches. Uh, you take your card, the card comes within that energy field. The energy field energizes a little chip. And then at that point, the chip then sends out a signal. Well, the problem with proximity cards is that the card number is transmitted just with raw data. Um, it uses ampl uh, AM, uh, amplitude mod modulation, ones and zeros. And if somebody was listening, they can simply record that, uh, that AM signal and replay it. If you present the card five times, you're going to get the exact same uh, you know, wave signal of ones and zeros. Very simple to produce uh, 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 to copy that card. A um, number of ways of doing that. I mean, you, you can go on you know, Amazon and buy handheld RFID writers. Um, if the card is in someone's pocket, you can just walk up behind them, press a button to read the card, and then press another button to unlock the door in front of the reader. And in some parts of the US, there's actually these, these kiosks. You know, very simply, if you have a Airbnb condo and you need 10 more cards, you just go put in, put in your card and then you get uh, 10 copies uh, spat out. Toronto has a bunch of front, uh, storefronts for the exact same purpose. So proximity and cloning is becoming a major, major issue. Um, how do you protect uh, that that person using the card is in fact the authorized person? Last risk is from the reader back to the control panel. So let's say, for example, you use very high secure cards that can't be cloned. You present that card in front of the reader, what the reader is going to do is it's simply going to transmit the card number back to the control panel. And then the control panel makes the decision to unlock the door or not. Again, you might use the most secure card in the world, but with weekend and clock of data type communications, um, you present the same card five times, you're going to get the same little ones or zeros transmitted across the wire. Um, again, if someone's clever enough to, to uh, uh, connect to that wire and record those little ones or zeros, they can easily replay um, those uh, the ones and zero pattern and gain access to the building. Um, lots of solutions for that. It's again, you're going to Amazon or some other specialty uh, websites. Uh, I know there's BL key, there's SB key. Um, you'll see a little board there in the top left, uh, but the size of a stamp, $75 available on online. Um, all the person would really need is about 15 minutes, maybe even 10 minutes in front of the reader. You would pull the reader off the wall. You use a little punch down tool to punch this little, uh, uh, this little PCB onto the wiring. Uh, the two wires for power would power the little module, and then it would start recording the, uh, uh, the card information that's transmitted across the, the green and the yellow. So he would you know, stuff that back in the wall, wait a couple of days. As people come by and present their tags, it would unlock the door, obviously, but it would also make a copy in that little card. A week later, the person comes back. The little, uh, the little unit is, is pumping out a, a, a private Wi-Fi. They can simply open up their mobile, mobile phone connect to the, uh, the hidden um, uh, Wi-Fi connection, go to a web page, and then there's all the credentials that people have presented. You simply click the little replay button and uh, the little card will um, uh, replay those ones or zeros. To the control panel, it had no idea. It just saw ones and zeros and thought it was the reader. So there's definitely some very easy and simple, simple tools out there to trick access control. So how do we solve these three problems? How do we solve the, the COVID uh, problem? How do we solve, or some of the COVID problems, how do we solve the man in the middle attacks with, uh, with weekend communication or, or card duplication? RBH's solution is using our blue line reader. Uh, the blue line reader solves all three of those. And let me explain how. 
the first solution uh, or the first uh, um, uh, risk that we looked at was about COVID. Um, so the Blue Line readers have built in a Bluetooth and NFC communications. And RBH is one of the few manufacturers that we provide a free mobile app. Uh, there's no tokens to buy, there's no portals to manage. All the user does is they just go to the iOS store or the Google Play store, they download the app, the app will generate the card number and generates a unique card number automatically right on the app. Just simply take that card number that's shown on the app, program it into any access control system the uh, reader's connected to, and now you're unlocking the door like any other credential. Now it's a highly secure credential because the card number can't be copied. Nobody has access to that card number. It's generated uh, uniquely and automatically when you download the app. And the card number is based on the time and day you download the app, where you are in the world, and the hardware fingerprint of the, uh, of the phone. So let's, you know, let's say someone want to make a copy of it. You know, they take a, a backup of the phone and they're storing on another phone, or they delete the app, reinstall the app. They're going to get a new card number. The card number will not, can't be copied. So it is, unique, uh, it is unique to that installation to that phone. Now, how does it solve problems? Well, first off, um, so let's take a look at visitor management. Uh, you know, you have a, a person that comes to, the, uh, to, to your premise, they need a credential for three or four days. Now they can just use their smartphone. They would download the app, tell you what the number is, you assign that as, as a visitor user, and now they can use their phone uh, without having to give them the credential. Uh, what about crowding around doors? The, the Bluetooth version of the credential has two buttons there. You'll see it on the right-hand side. Uh, the large button is using the full uh, uh, Bluetooth range of the phone, typically about 10 meters or 33, 33 feet. Um, you know, so now you can unlock that door far distances, further distances from having to come up to the reader. Uh, the smaller button is if you have a couple readers side by side. So let's say you have, uh, you know, it's a lobby and there's four or five readers there in the lobby. You don't want to press the big button because who knows what reader you're going to hit. So you come up a little closer, the default range for that smaller button is about six to eight inches. Press a little button and it, uh, it will unlock. So completely free, very easy to manage, and a great, great solution for uh, you know, maintaining distance and, and, uh, and creating a co contactless environment for COVID. Regarding card cloning, Blue Line has some unique advantages as well. Um, now this is related to encryption. The reason why you, you can't copy a card very easily with Blue Line readers is it's using the DESFIRE technology. Now, there's a couple of different ways DESFIRE technology works. I'm just going to quickly explain how we do DESFIRE technology. First off, DESFIRE technology is using a special smart card. And think of that card like a, like a computer or, or a filing folder. Uh, a little computer has multiple folders, and those little folders can hold multiple files. And each one of those files and folders and card has a, a, a different encryption key. So when someone presents their uh, blue, uh, the Blue Line Desfire card to the Blue Line reader, the first thing that needs to happen is that the card and the reader need to authenticate using a master key. As long as the master key authenticates and, and they share the same key, then the reader's online with the card. Second thing the reader will do while it's online doesn't just ask for the card number, it asks for different pieces of the card number. It's held in different folders in the card. So let's say, you know, it's looking for four or five different folders. Each one of those folders are protected with their own master key and application keys. Once that, those, that information is brought back to the, uh, to the Blue Line reader, it needs to decrypt it using a different set of keys, and then take those three or four different folders, put them together, grab the information it needs to then generate the actual card number. So you don't really need to understand specifically how that works, but what you do need to understand is this cannot be copied because we're not just talking about encryption. Even if you know how to unencrypt the, the various modern types of encryptions that we use, you still won't know what folders to get the card number and how to decrypt and re-put re those card numbers into the actual card number itself. Um, so very, very difficult. Um, and, and for the foreseeable future, unlikely we're going to be able to uh, duplicate these, uh, these DESFIRE credentials. The last risk is from the reader to the control panel. Now, what typically we've been using for years is a WIGAN or a clock and data type of communication. And the big problem with that is uh, you present the card five times and it's going to communicate the exact same ones or zeros that the raw information back to the control panel. Even if you're using biometric and desfire credentials, it's going to be encrypted to the reader, but it's going to be plain English from the reader back to the control panel. So the so solution to this is to use a protocol called OSDP. Now there's a couple different versions, there's version one. Version two is the one that we're gonna be talking about. Now the first thing that OSDP does is it talks in the, uh, on the RS-45 communication, it's not WIGAN. 
that you need to hook this up to a control panel that supports RS, uh, RS-45. Most uh, RBH control panels do. Um, the second thing is when you buy the reader, you actually have to not just hook it up, but you need to bind the control panel to the reader itself. You have to put the control panel into a, a binding mode, you hook up a, a reader to it, and what that reader is going to do is it's going to bind itself and then generate a unique encryption key that's only the control panel and the reader is going to communicate with. And the key is going to change on a regular basis. If someone should take off the reader and try to replace it with another one, it flat out won't work because it hasn't been binded and it's gonna have a different encryption key. The control panel will also generate a trouble. It sees that the reader is gonna be removed and generate a, a supervisory trouble. Now, there's no way for someone to go and maliciously put a, a man in the middle uh, a module in there. If they present the card five times, the encryption will prevent them from understanding that, that, that uh, data. So OSDP is a fantastic solution for preventing uh, man in the middle. So let's uh, take a look at the blue line readers themselves. So it's so a whole portfolio of products, uh, and depending on which model you, you order, you'll get a couple different features. Um, first off, the form factors come in either mullion, single gang, or single gang with keypad if you need that. There's also biometric or biometric with keypad. Now, it doesn't matter what form factor you use, they're all gonna come with the Bluetooth and NFC communication built in. It doesn't matter which model you use, you'll always be able to use the free RBH uh, mobile credentials. Now, when you're buying the physical credentials, you can order them with either the RBH Desfire security, or you can buy generic, um, uh, generic uh, MyFair credentials. If you want the high level security, you're gonna to wanna to buy the readers as well as the credentials through us, and the keys will be shared and be fully locked down. Nobody will be able to copy those. But let's say you're doing a takeover. You're doing a takeover, they have 2,000 existing MyFair credentials. You don't wanna to have to buy new credentials. So what you can do is you can just use the, uh, the unencrypted serial numbers or CSN of those credentials. You're not gonna get any security, but you will be able to reuse those MyFair credentials. Uh, lastly, communication formats. These do not have to go on RBH control panels. If you order them with the 50-bit weekend format, they'll work on pretty much any uh, RBH control panel that, uh, that, that's out there. Um, but you can also order them as weekend 34-bit. Um, that would be used for uh, let's say you want to hook it up to a Genetech panel or a Cantec panel, some non-RBH panel. Uh, like 26-bit, 34-bit is also relatively industry standard. So you can order it with an industry standard protocol and hook it up to third-party uh, um, uh, control panels. Uh, lastly, you can order them with OSDP. And again, for higher secure applications, um, this would be the recommended uh, uh, model. Now, again, you don't have to use RBH control panels. OSDP is an open standard. So you can take these OSDP readers, hook them up to, again, a Genetech or some other control panel that's gonna support the OSDP protocol. So that's, uh, that's my presentation for today. Um, I think I'll open up uh, to, to any questions that you might have. Great, thank you, Christopher. We do have uh, a few questions here. First up is, what level of security do RBH's virtual mobile credentials provide? Absolutely. Um, so the, 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 the level of, of security that they provide uh, is an incremental level above a standard credential. Uh, one of the nice features of, uh, of a mobile credential is that the phone needs to be unlocked for it to actually uh, function. You know, if you drop your card and someone picks it up, they can then use that card to access the building. Uh, with a mobile credential, if you drop your phone, you won't be able to just pick up the phone and present it at the reader. You actually need to unlock the phone. Once the phone is unlocked, then the mobile credential will then operate. So that's a that's a, like a like a, a, a multi-factor authentication you know built in. Um, the second level of, of of security that they add is that no one's actually looking at the card number. No, one, no one's managing a database of all these mobile apps and, and, and mobile credentials. Um, when you download the app, the uh, the card number that you would program in for that mobile app. Um, is unique to the phone. It, 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 it generates itself automatically uh, on the phone itself. So there would be no way for somebody to take a look at what an existing mobile credential is and reprogram that and clone it on another, uh, another phone, another device. That is impossible. You can't even you know, copy your phone and put it on a new phone. That, uh, that, would, that would generate a new card number. Um, so the fact that no one is looking at the credential, no one can regenerate the credential, and it adds an extra layer of, of, uh, of uh, multi-factor authentication when you're using it. So um, definitely an extra level above a standard uh, physical credential. 
Great, thank you. Uh, let's see if I can get this next one out without tripping. Uh, is the read range still three to six inches and is the time 90 milliseconds or is it going to take longer to process with all the encryption? Yeah, it is going to take a lot longer. Uh, now, when I say a lot longer, we're talking about, you know, 90 milliseconds to 100 milliseconds, uh, but it is noticeable. So the reason it's noticeable is because of the bidirectional communication. So, you know, the days are gone of where you would take your credential and put it in your wallet and then you just hold your wallet up to, to, the, uh, uh, to the reader. Uh, or you would present your credential, you know, six inches away and it would unlock. Uh, because of the, 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 uh, the additional information that, that we need to process, um, it is a noticeable delay. Um, and this is one of the problems with the, with the COVID is, you know, with, with uh, DESFIRE technology as a whole, not just RBH, but DESFIRE technology as a whole and all this encryption the manufacturers are going through, um, you now have to hold the card in front of the reader for a bit of a moment. I wouldn't say a full second, but for a bit of a, bit of a moment. In high traffic areas, that you know, could create a, you know, crowding around the door. Um, so the solution to that is also using the, the blue line, uh, the Bluetooth version of, of the app. You can unlock it uh, a lot further away. So, um, it, you know, it's not de 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 detrimental. You're not waiting seconds and seconds for the door to unlock, but there is a noticeable delay when you're going from proximity to, to a DESFIRE on, on any manufacturer of access control uh, reader that's using DESFIRE. Great, thank you. Uh, we've got, someone is asking if we could get an email on this, so I will uh, provide their email to you. And yes, uh, Christopher will send you uh, an email of uh, the recording of today's session when we're done here. Uh, and it looks like our last question is how are RBH's virtual mobile credentials different than other manufacturers? Yeah, and uh, I, I did a uh, relative, I, I kind of explained it before. So the big one is that there's no cost for those mobile credentials. A lot of the other manufacturers, you have to buy uh, keys or tokens or licenses. Uh, you have to buy them in, in you know, user quantities of 50 or 100. So um, there's an immediate cost savings when you're using the mobile credential that way. Uh, and the second one is, is the level of security. So because no one is managing um, those uh, credentials, uh, it's very simplistic to use them. Um, it's as simple as simply downloading the app onto a phone and then the card number that's shown on your phone, program that in like any other card that you would use on any other access control system. That's it. A lot of our competitors, you would have to, again, take these licenses or, or tokens. You'd have to then go ahead and manage them and authorize them and send them out and activate them. All that, compl uh, uh, all that um, uh, complexity has been removed uh, with the RBH mobile credential. So easier to use, lower price, um, uh, that would be the answer. Great, thank you. And actually, we just had one more pop in. Are your mobile credentials supported on access control systems other than RBH? Uh, so yes and no. Uh, you, you won't be able to use the mobile credential on a non-RBH reader but you can use the blue line reader on a non-RBH control panel. So unfortunately, you won't be able to use the Bluetooth reader, uh, or sorry, the, uh, the, the, the Bluetooth or NFC uh, mobile credential on, for example, an HID reader. The, the reader and the mobile credential need to be RBH. But again, you, you, uh, you would order the OSDP or we can 34-bit version of the blue line reader. And then at that point, you can hook it up to a you know, Cantec, a Genetech, or any of those uh, uh, major uh, access control control panels. Great, thanks. And uh, somebody's made a liar out of me. We now have one more question. Uh, can you explain one more time how Blue Line Reader is married to the control panel? Yeah, so that's with the, the OSDP. Let me just go back to that. So um, when we're talking about OSDP, uh, we're not hooking up to the Wigan communication port. Uh, with Wigand, there is no marry. Whatever Wigand reader that you would hook up to the, to the Wigand input on the control panel, you know, data comes in and it, it processes it. Uh, when you're using OSDP, it's using a digital communication RS-45, um, and there's bi-directional communication. It's not just data coming from the reader to the control panel, it's the reader and the control panel talking together, like two control panels talking together. So how you would marry it is, first off, when you order the reader, um, the, each reader has an address and you have to put the reader into a pairing mode and, as well as a control panel. Different manufacturers, you do it in different ways, um, but you would effectively put the control panel into a pairing mode. At that point, once the control panel and reader are in a pairing mode, when they're hooked up together, they would then pair. 
When they're paired, the control panel will start supervising the reader based on its unique hardware information, as well as start generating a, a shared encryption key. There's a default key, but the key changes on a regular basis. So once that key is established and the reader and control panel are taken out of the pairing mode, the key which was used to establish communication is now changed and it is also changed on a regular basis. So think of pairing a, a Bluetooth headset, you have to put into a mode and share a password, same deal. There's a, a pairing, pairing communication is established and if there's any change or broken uh, uh, or uh, uh, shutdown of that communication, both parties uh, are supervising that and, and, and are aware of it. Great, thank you. So that brings us to the end of today's session. Thank you for joining us. And once, once again, thank you to Christopher Nolan and RVH for their support. At the close of this session, a link to register for next week's session will pop up. Please be sure to register. We look forward to seeing you, and I'm lying to you, next week uh, actually is a holiday, so I'm going to wish everybody a uh, happy Canada Day, and we will see you the following Wednesday. Until then, be well. <laughs>